Hi there, beautiful people. I'm Tracy Rigdon. And I'm TV's Shelton Hall. And welcome to the Contrast Project. I um, wanted to go over a recap before we got started here. A mm -hmm. uh, recap of some of the things we already talked about as it pertains to uh, you know, Black Lives Matter sure. and the community involvement that we've been talking about in the last couple of episodes. Yeah. Uh, we know that, you know, 2020 has been, uh, you know, a super busy year. Uh, and, and notwithstanding the pandemic, yeah, but it's been it's been a pretty violent year, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and and Black Lives Matter, like we talked uh, before, it got a resurgence, uh, more energy, uh, more energetic with their protesting and so forth around yeah. the country after George Floyd's death, mm -hmm. May 25th, and uh, it, it's it's also turned into. Uh, one of the largest community engagement type uh, demonstrations uh, that we've probably seen, sir, you know, in, in our history, because there's huge protests all over the country, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, most of the ones, practically all the ones I've seen here in Jacksonville and in Clay County, have been totally been peaceful, yeah, uh, except for some, you know, minor heckling and stuff like that. Sure. Uh, but uh, we, we haven't seen the violent breakouts like we've seen other places in, in the country. And, uh, and uh, we, we also, just this past weekend, an, another black, unarmed black man was shot in the back, Jacob Blake, mm -hmm. and the protests you know, broke out there and, and a, lot of, a lot of looting and fires, and, and it got pretty bad. And so uh, uh, we, we know that uh, the looting and now you're starting to see uh, with those protests also the law enforcement are showing up looking like militia. Sure. It, it's not even, they don't even look like, uh, you know, uh, police officers anymore. A lot of them that were showing up in other cities uh, were wearing military uniforms without badges or anything on them. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't tell who they were and, yeah. and the headgear they were wearing, you couldn't see their faces. Sure. So, you know, they're very anonymous about it. And so, uh, one of the other things uh, that we know to be true is August has become quite a substantial yes. uh, community involvement for the Black Lives Matter and, and other community engagement uh, initiatives. Yeah. Uh, uh, right off the bat, uh, it's National uh, uh, Black-Owned Business Month. That's true. And, and you're involved with that, yes. uh, with your newsletter coming up. That's right. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Uh, but, uh, and then we uh, uh, we also visited a uh, uh, Black-Owned Small Business in Orange Park uh -huh. this past week, uh, uh, Mackey's Munchies, yes. where they were doing a uh, give back to the community for back to school. It was light up the nights for the school children. And the... Uh, her her co-coordinator, uh, uh, Tanisha Crisp, she's also a business owner herself, mm -hmm. and uh, and she's planning another big initiative coming up too in October. Right. Um, but uh, Mackey's and them uh, teamed up together and they got together about a little over 200 backpacks for the children yeah. to give out. It was it was quite a success. It was a success. It really was. Uh, so uh, the other big thing that we know is gonna is gonna make an impact on the community at large, but it's a historical thing and it's something that a lot of people basically haven't really known that much about. Yeah. Uh, is uh, the 60th anniversary of Axe Handle Saturday is coming up uh, this Thursday, yeah. the 27th, and there's gonna be a uh, commemorative uh, uh, event down at uh, Hemming Park. They haven't re renamed it yet. Right. <laughs> it would be a good day to do that. <laughs> it would. It would. It would. Uh, and uh, so uh, you recently wrote the uh, cover story for uh, Polio uh, Weekly uh, 2.0, the uh, 60 Years Later yeah. Axe Handle Saturday. <laughs> Sponsored so, by Phillips and Hunt. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I did. Uh, it was cool, you know, Folio. After 33 years in business, they got um, they got their butts handed to them by the pandemic, like so many mm -hmm. uh, print publications right. did, especially the the alt weeklies. And the alt weeklies have tended to be more of a liberal, progressive voice uh, right. in communities around the country, especially here in here in Northeast Florida. You, you know, 
politics and a lot of the arts and music coverage mm -hmm. kind of comes through these things. And publications all over the country were just decimated by the pandemic oh, yeah. pretty quick. And uh, yeah. Folio went down in March, um, Sam Taylor retired, and then uh, Mr. Phillips uh, with his law firm, they stepped in a couple of months later and uh, revitalized the, the mm -hmm. paper. This is, they're now a monthly publication rather than a weekly, but the, the web, the you know, folioweekly.com is still like active on a regular basis. Right. And they've right. got, a, got a good, he brought in a good bunch of people, uh, John Alaska, the creative director, uh, Issa Barrientos, the staff writer, mm -hmm. Lindsay Nolan, um, and whatnot. It's it's the, as young as the staff has ever been. Like we've got a lot of people in the early 20s. This issue, in fact, features uh, a little feature about um, about 18 under 18. You know, young young <laughs> people, high schoolers, and stuff who are making a big uh, making a big impact in the community. Very nice. Okay, you can read that from here, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> And they asked me to talk about Axe Handle Saturday, uh, the anniversary of it. So I sat down with um, Rodney Hurst, right, author, right. educator, um, activist. He the was activist young in his life, yeah, too. Yeah, he was 16 years old. He, he graduated high school at 16, actually. Uh, he was the president of the NAACP Youth Council, which had a couple hundred members uh, at the time. And they began leading uh, these sit-ins, the first sit-in. Um, notably, uh, of that era was uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina. Right. Starting in, I believe, February 1st, 1960. And so they, 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 there were several sit-ins all around the country uh, in the months, mm -hmm. in the months going forward. Most of which were led by college students. Yeah. Right. Um, this was this was one of the few, perhaps the only one, that was led exclusively by children, uh, mostly high schoolers, which is mm -hmm. why they waited till summertime. Um, downtown Jacksonville at the time had. A couple of um, you know lunch counters. It's the right. lunch counter concept is something you may not be. It's not something we would really recognize now. What I would compare it to would be something like, like if you go to IKEA, right? And you mm -hmm. go to IKEA and you buy all the furniture and stuff. And they've got a little cafeteria, like little food right. items and stuff. Back in the day, places like uh, F. W. Woolworths, uh, May Cohen's, Grants, whatnot, they had lunch counters where right. you know go get a cheeseburger. Go to the diner. <laughs> yeah, it, which was kind of yeah. This was but yeah, this was before malls became a thing. Mm -hmm. Like the shopping mall concept with um, retail establishments side by side with like the food court. That was kind of a new innovation. Mm -hmm. That the food counter thing. That's what they were sort of doing. Right. So they went in and uh, they began the they began to sit down and then uh, then they stood up and then sat down again and. All kinds of crazy things happen. We'll talk more about that. Okay. Okay, let me tell y'all. I have the best crew ever. Shout out to my sous chef, uh, Tiffany. If her dude is watching this, she's the queen of Mackey's Munchies. So if you're watching this, you'll know what this is about. And um, I just have a really talented staff. My kids, Brendan and Brayden, mommy loves you. I appreciate you. Um, and thank you guys for all that you do here at Mackey's Munchies. All right, don't forget to come and see me, 868 Blandon Boulevard. Open doors at 868 Blandon Boulevard. We love you. Hey, we got one more thing coming. I just got a food truck. So if you guys want to reserve a private catering, holla at your girl. I ain't even putting this on for everybody else. Only my cool friends that watch Folio get to know that Miss Mackey got a food truck and can reserve it first. All right, we'll talk to you later. Where do we leave off? We were talking about uh, about Axe Handle Saturday and about right. Um, you know, Axe Handle Saturday was August 27th, 1960. It was a Saturday. This year, it's on a Thursday. We're recording now on Tuesday, the 25th. They did the first sit-in on August 13th, I believe. Mm -hmm. And every day except for Sundays, they did a they did a sit-in of some type at one of the lunch all counters. The, Usually yeah, the lunch counters all around there. Woolworths yeah. or Grants. Mm -hmm. Saturday was when it, that the 27th is when it really reached its peak. And, you know, that's when you had, like, the major blowback as far as the, uh, you know. And the numbers were astounding, too. Yeah. It was, like, only, what, 35 kids. 35 kids. And then it, the crowd reached, like, 200, they said, estimated. Yeah. And, and they, were, they were all adult, angry white men with yeah. sticks and bats and yeah. sandals. Yeah, FBI. And going yeah. after kids. The FBI wrote a um, memo about it, which they delivered to the sheriff because, of course, they were paying attention to 
this whole movement as it was spreading that summer, mm -hmm. as we're seeing the same thing this year. And uh, one of um, Sheriff Carson's deputies uh, was uh, sympathetic to the opposition, so he grabbed hold of it, you know, hit up the Klan, gave him the Iggy, wised up the marks, and they, they gathered on a Wednesday to plan the counter protest. Uh, I call it a counter protest. That is a it's a severe euphemism, <laughs> right, right? You know, but you know, it's um, it's an interesting thing because back then, with those types of situations, you know, you had to rely on the civilian community to come forth and uh, crack heads and attack the protesters. Now we have official sources doing it. We have uh, the police doing it. You were talking earlier about the militarization of the police, and right. And I wanted to just uh, just rant about that a little bit because it's something that's been going on in general for quite some time you know i'd say the last definitely the last 10 years or so where we've seen a real trend of um the u.s military mm -hmm. you know, not even the military but the government the you know, civilian government taking military surplus and offering these materials yeah. to uh police forces around around the country everything mm -hmm. from you know personnel carriers pers yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh you know helicopters right all types of things and so there's there's that, there's this, you know, military surplus, you yeah. know, being out, offloaded to civilian police. And then there's also an offloading of tactics. Uh, as, we, as I was saying earlier, it's almost like the trend is to make the cops more like SWAT teams. Right, you know? right. And, and, and they're, they're far more intimidating now with all that gear. Yes. When they walk into a crowd and they're wearing all that gear, mm -hmm. it, it's more intimidating. It's, it's meant to be, especially, okay, absolutely. For, especially for, you know, the generation of today's youth, which has been raised up on, you know, seeing that type of imagery, and they automatically associate it with trouble. Yeah. You know. Right. Right. That's a tough one, I tell you. Uh, it, it, it was. Uh, there were what 50 people injured in in the attack. Yeah. And 62 were arrested. So, uh, makes you wonder if if uh, if. Uh, any of the ones that were arrested that were the counter protesters of those are they still around uh, do they have any regrets or do they still have that mindset you I know you know I looked around I tried to find people uh, who were associated with it um, I think most of them are dead I know Hearst told me that out of the 35 um, kids who who sat in that day fewer than half a dozen are still um, alive today. Really? So then if you consider the idea that, you know, they were all teenagers, mm -hmm. uh, if you yeah. consider the idea that all the counter-protesters were in many cases much older, in their 20s or 30s or more, you know, the percentage of those people that are still around, you know, is probably very, very small. And those that are still around would probably not be keen to um, to talk about their involvement in that. You know, the, the media didn't cover it at the time. Local media didn't no, cover it at no. the time. And it didn't wind up in any of the school literature for years and years oh, no. and years. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, um, myself included, knew nothing about it. Yeah. Knew, knew nothing about it until, you know, I was yeah. an older teenager. The, the inter I mean, it's really the Internet that brought a lot of this stuff into the, into the public view and, and mm -hmm. really gave us sort of a context for everything. Right. And... Um, yeah, now I did, uh, I've talked with several people who spoke off the record who had family members that were mm -hmm. involved, fathers, uncles, grandparents, stuff like that. And, you know, by and large, you know, and the ones I talked to, even those with a more conservative inclination, you know, like as we were talking about with the George Floyd type protests, there are a lot of people that are naturally conservative, maybe even right wing to some extent, but they're agitated about some of the things that are going on because sure. the concept of government overreach and you know militarization of police that is a subject that people on both sides of the aisle can um, can embrace and, and that that really brings in into context the the whole movement of people that are talking about defunding the police right that they uh, so many people seem to think that that means they want to do away with the police sure and, and that's not what they want to well, to they, be fair, some of them do. Some of them do, yeah. You know, uh, that's why. You but know, if you give them less money to spend on military gear, mm -hmm. and maybe put more of that money from that same piggy bank, yeah, give that to more community uh, uh, organizations that might sure. be linked to the police department. Mm -hmm. You know, because they've got yeah. you know police athletic leagues and stuff like that. Sure. And keep keep the kids busy, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, it starts young. 
Absolutely. It's, it's tarts, yeah. And so, you know, if you, if you give them less money to spend on that gear, and they ask for more and more. Yeah. Every year. Every our sheriff here in town. Yeah. Just ask for more money. Mm -hmm. He wanted they more should money. Take, they should take that money they're spending on all this military surplus mm -hmm. and put it into the pension fund. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. The pension fund that's in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's always in trouble. Always. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well in closing, uh, let's let's uh let's talk about we mentioned earlier your newsletter coming out for yes. small businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uplift newsletter. Yeah, the uh, it's called the Uplift, uh, U P L Y F T. Uh, we're online at theuplift2020.com. It was something we've uh, been putting together over the course of this summer. Um, we partnered. Well, my colleague with the newsletter is Mal Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, you may know Mal best for hosting the Lyricist Live, which is the open freestyle cipher at the um, at the at the Art Walk every month. Uh -huh, yeah. uh, they've been doing it over a decade. No fights, no arrests, no negativity at all. It's also given voice to a lot of um, activists and musicians, rappers and whatnot. Rodney Hurst uh, sat in uh, on one of the sessions once talking about Axe Handle Sunday. The idea of the of the uplift, it's kind of a, it's a 20 by 20 broadsheet. I don't have a copy here. I'm even think of it sort of like that would be the finish thing and then it folds over and then it folds over again and mm -hmm. it focuses on just odds and ends of the, the black community you know, right we try to focus on we'll do a little feature about a small business about art about music about politics about media all you know we hit all the education we hit mm -hmm. all these subjects uh, through the prism of of Northeast Florida's black community so this this first issue issue one which will be out in early September it's got um, it's got a, an overview of the history of of black newspapers, right, uh, black right. media, particularly as it relates to Northeast Florida, mm -hmm. with uh, with some people like the Florida Star, Jacksonville Star, Free right. Press, Blacksonville, uh, the Black Duval on Facebook. There's something about that. There's something about Color Jack's Blue, which our friend Shawana Brooks right. We're gonna is, be talking to her. Is so. doing out on the mm -hmm. north side. A great arts initiative. Uh, there's a we take a little look at Edward Waters College which is um, doing some of their best numbers ever. They are uh, expanding their, their bachelor's degree programs mm -hmm. and they are beginning, they're beginning the process of offering master's degrees and That's great. as they move towards full university, um, full university status. And there will be a couple other things that uh, I can't talk about because I don't know what they are yet. I'll, <laughs> I'll think about that later. Now with the uh, now with the uplift, that it's a fun little thing. Mal and I were contacted by uh, our friend Winder Hughes, who runs the Relevant app. If you don't have the Relevant app, R E L E V N T, right? Um, you should download that for for iPhone and Android. It's a great app that allows you to it basically geotags you, and wherever you are at whatever time, you can find out what's going on in your area. You can customize it. Um, you know jazz music or, mm -hmm. or football or you know political activism things like like that and it'll show you where things are within your jurisdiction mm -hmm. and on whatever particular date you're on and they each they all have like a community there's a community interactivity of it so mm -hmm. you yes. can go so you can click on the uh, you can click on the tab for whatever concert is coming mm -hmm. up and then you can get into a discussion with other people that are going to the concert or put up links to videos or once you're there put up your own videos from right, the concert right. and things like that i've got it on my phone <laughs> and we de and we developed uh the, so the uplift tab the uplift concept began as a way of bringing the black community engaged uh with with the relevant app so it's we're going to we're still populating it now but all the as many black owned businesses especially bars clubs restaurants sports right. things arts uh mm -hmm. culture stuff that's all going to be listed in one easy place for folks who want to help support that community and that's uh, great that's and, yeah, great yeah and trina uh, trina dockery has really been uh she's kind of the business manager of the process she's been essential as far as bringing everybody together uh josh hoy the um does all the art artwork and the graphic design right and of right. course yeah winder who's just running the whole a little thing. bit of everything <laughs> yeah he's he's a he's a pistol there you go there you go now you have a you have another interesting uh 
uh, article coming up, which should be of interest to a lot of people in town just as much as the axe handle, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, you're doing an article for Boyd Live. That's right. Uh, that's going to be out in their issue in 1st of September. Yeah, 1st first, uh, first week of September. About American Beach. American Beach, yeah. Uh, American Beach is founded by uh, A.L. Lewis, uh, insurance magnate, uh, the first black millionaire in uh, Florida's history. Uh, he started up about 1935, and it was designed basically to provide a beach community. It's about 40 acres, the whole community. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful out there. It's to, really nice out there. Uh, to yeah. provide a, a beach community and beach access for, for African Americans where they could mm -hmm. go and enjoy it without being harassed, without being, right. you know, right. because all that stuff was a real issue in sure. the days of Jim Crow. Sure. You know. Sure. And, uh, and so it's been going, he died in 47, but the, it's still continuing, you know, American Beach, it's right next to Fernandina. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of overlap among like the central services right. and whatnot. And a big portion of the story is talking about my old friend, the beach lady, mm -hmm. Vani Betch, who was actually born in 1935, the same year that American Beach was founded. How about that? You know? And her, her family- She became an icon out there. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> her family, her, her great grandmother or something like that was Anna Kingsley you know, from Kingsley Plantation. Mm -hmm. And the Kingsley's granddaughter, King, Anna and Zeph Zephaniah Kingsley, their granddaughter was A.L. Lewis's wife. So she's got like some good like, black power on both sides <laughs> of her lineage. She graduated high school, when she graduated college, she went up to, oh, I, cannot, I can't remember what college she went to, but then she went right off to Europe and became mm -hmm. an opera singer. Mm -hmm. And she spent m much of the 50s and 60s in Europe, uh, singing classical music. Then in the 70s, she came back, uh, came back to Florida, and, you know, 1970s was a time of sort of economic malaise, you know? <laughs> it's like everything kind of in the country kind of went into a little bit of disrepair, like a little right. dust, a little dinginess to everything, <laughs> you know, uh, civic, in terms of civic uh, things. And so she went out, she came out to American Beach and became pretty much the primary advocate for yeah. American Beach. She's the reason the place was able to finally get historical designation, um, the museum and things like that. Brought in a lot of new people. She died in, in 05, but her legacy continues. Mm -hmm. She was one of the original uh, champion dreads of Northeast Florida. She did, she did her dreads, some massive dreads. Yeah, they were, you know, yeah, her, <laughs> they were down to like her ankles. And, uh -huh, yeah. and, and you know, you think about things like the commemoration of Axe Handle Sunday when I remember in the late 90s when they were they were doing, you know, black awareness, black empowerment marches. She was out there for that. Mm -hmm. So like this whole, all the stuff that's, you know, black owned businesses and American Beach, Axe Handle Saturday, things, things like that. All the stuff going on in August. Her her fingerprints are kind of on, on a lot everything. Of that yeah, 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 yeah. She is uh, greatly missed. Well, that's great. That's great. Well, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. We're going to nope, close this out, but before... Oh, give me that elbow. Elbow. There you go. Finally, before we go, I want to give a great big shout out to our producer, Mr. Guy Romer. Yes. Out here at Intergalactic Domination Studios. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to make sure that everybody knows to stay in touch with us, yeah. to keep up with us, you can find The Contrast Project on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And you can, uh, on the YouTube channel, like, share, comment. Yeah. And don't forget to what? Smash that like button. Or smash the subscribe smash the button. The subscribe button, yeah. Just <laughs> smash all the buttons. Until next time, we'll see you. Peace.